Hi, my name is Mike Henry. I'm a manager of data analytics at Arc Resources, an upstream oil and gas company here in Calgary. Today I'm here to talk about modernizing uh, data ecosystem within your environment and the journey that we've went on to get there. Okay, our next speaker, uh, uh, Mike Henry from Arc Resources. Um, we, uh, KDN's been working with Arc Resources since 2015 and uh, we had a session in May with Mike Hartman who came in and told you all about what's going on at Arca Resources from the merger acquisition perspective with seven generations and the infrastructure changes that have been made. Um, Mike Henry was actually supposed to present during that time but had a life event happen, but we're very happy to have Mike come back and talk to us now and dive in, get specific on what's going on with data and analytics um, and the great story that uh, Arc Resources is uh, you know, embarking on and the progress they're making. So with that, I'd like to welcome uh, Mike to the stage. Thank you. Thank you Bill, for having me. Excited to talk here. Looks like there was a lot of good conversation. Yogi, you covered a lot of stuff that I don't have to cover now, or we can keep debating it. Your guys' choice. Um, so who am I? I've been um, at Arc Resources. I manage our data analytics team. I've been there for about 18 years, so I'm a lifer um, at Arc Resources. Um, uh, we went through a big merger with 7G a couple years ago. Um, that was a pretty significant event for us. When I started, I think we were 36,000 BOE. Um, so we were pretty tiny, and I think now we're at 360, 375 or something like that. Um, I'm a born and bred Calgarian, so I've been here forever. Um, I'm a tech junkie and a, and a sports junkie, so my whole life's been around basketball. Um, and I've been in the industry for 20 years, ranging from back in the day when I was doing software development firms into health and healthcare, and now into oil and gas for the last 18. Um, bit of an agenda here. I think we'll probably blow it out of the water given how this conversation went. So I like conversations, so if you've got questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, but essentially, I'm just gonna walk through the journey that we've been through at ARC um, relative to data. Um, Yogi did a lot of talking around digital transformation. Um, you can't be in tech if you're not transforming every 12 to 18 months. So I think that we've been on this journey my entire career. I mean, I started when we were syncing handheld devices, Palm devices, Cassiopeia's. If I had hair, it'd be gray. Um, and so if you remember those, I was doing synchronization back then and we thought it was transformative and, and so forth. But at Arc, um, and I've been there forever, so I won't talk about my, my maybe about my previous journey. I'll, I'll kind of focus on data. But in 2010, um, we said we have to do data better. And so at the time, um, Excel, 2010, we're 2022 today, um, it's still there. But I think that largely in 2010, our organization was user driven. They controlled the keys, they owned it specifically around data. Um, you know, I think about tiering this data ecosystem from data layers to presentation layers to user layers. Um, and in 2010, they controlled everything. Excel was the god you know, I'd argue that it still is. Um, Microsoft Access, which was prevalent everywhere, still prevalent today. So this picture, I mean, it looks a little bit different, but it's not much. Um, you know, with this, I'd say with this architectural design or with this organizational design, you have a really lack of control and governance. Um, so I'm not sure of your name. Mark, was that? Yeah. Mark, um, you know, he talked a lot about data quality. I think that when, when this exists, I think it's the only tool they had um, it's what they could use. They did a good job of it, except it was brittle. Um, and so it's very tough to manage from a user's perspective as the data journey grows. And, and everyone's a tech person here. Raise your hand, yeah, for the most part. Um, you know, I'm not going to beat the how data is multiplying and exponentially growing, but as data gets bigger, it gets harder to manage. Um, so in 2010, we said we have to do this better. So we kind of stood up a team um, around data warehousing and BI in the traditional sense. Um, and so we added another layer. And so we said, okay, we've got a data layer, we've got a corporate data and ETL layer, that's the group that we stood up. Um, we still had a presentation layer, 
and we had users that were consuming it. However, this still existed. So all the stuff that Excel and Microsoft Access didn't go away. And that kind of takes time. And so what we did do was we said, okay, where, where, can we, where can we find value? Where can we find opportunity? We thought that the back office was the place to start. Yogi talked a lot about you know, data management and master data management. That was the whole thing. Um, you know, at the time, you know, we had seven or eight systems that all had a different well list. They all had different cost centers. They all had different DOIs. They all had different. So part of our task when we started this group was, okay, do we know what a cost center is? Is it blessed everywhere? Does our field data capture system know what it is? Is the UWI to cost center link hooked up? Is my raw to nest estimated sales legit? Well, let's make sure that the cost center is in CS, which is our land system, uh, Qbyte matched, and that the, those matched with our field data capture system at the time was PBR. Um, and so we had just had a whole project where we said, okay, let's understand our well list. And then what we did is we stood up stewards in the business that owned their portion. So we had somebody that owned CS, we had somebody that owned PPR, we had somebody. And we said, okay, guys, we built a visual, I think Yogi talked about that, that said, show me where we have busts. Who owns what piece of information? Your job is to cleanse it. It's not IT's job. So if there was a throat to choke, it wasn't our world, it was the business's world. And I think that's where it should be. Um, so in 2010, we started building, we got an accounting cube, we had a volumes cube that we did it. Um, it was transformational. You know, we hooked up Excel, so we hooked up Excel directly to it, and so we didn't take away a tool that everybody knew. We said, here's a tool that you understand, we're just gonna show you how to use it a little bit differently. Different, different version of VLOOKUP, I'll say. Um, if you didn't know what a pivot table was, we kind of told you, we gave you some training. And what we decided not to do, we decided not to touch on the stuff that we didn't try to fix. And so we were very deliberate about targeting the things that we were choosing to do. And everything else, I don't wanna say we ignored it, um, but we chose to just do what you're gonna do. We don't wanna disrupt you too badly because everyone hates change, even though they, they're always going through change. So that was, that was a bit of a journey in 2010. Um, if you fast forward to 2015, um, our back office environment for our data warehousing started to grow. And so I think the credibility that we got with putting accounting data into people's hands that didn't have to know Qbyte and putting volumes data into people's hands that didn't necessarily have to know how to traverse PVR at the time, um, we started to go with forecasting, long-term planning, OPEX, forecasting, you name it, we got reserves in there. Um, so the trust that we had in those two, those two projects, I'll say, gave us trust capital within the business. Within the business. And, and I have a philosophy is, um, you know, I've got a software development background, um, and so there's a programmer, and then there's a business developer. And what we were trying to do at the same time that we were building this program in 2010 is we were trying to build business acumen and the guys that were building the tools. And so I, I rarely have translators between the person who's using the tool and the person who's building the tool. And I think that if you, if you can get rid of that, and I think it's a hard skill to teach or it's a hard skill to find, is that you're the, the canyon that exists between IT and between the business starts to close because my team can go talk to a, a CA about accounting and we can go talk to a field operator about volumes and, and have a meaningful conversation. We're not the experts, but then we're also not seen as the idiots with respect to the business context that they're trying to describe. So we spent a lot of time and energy and effort building our team's acumen around the business to deliver value. So that started to grow. And so we had less of this because a lot of our back office systems were, were now governed and managed and blessed and we had reports that told you where it was out and where it was fixed and who had to go fix it. And so, um, and then came Phil, right? <laughs> came Phil and Spotfire and Katie on. And, you know, I've always heard this, it, you know, Spotfire is Excel on steroids, right? And as a purist, I'm a bit of a purist, um, like it was my ultimate antagonist. And so, you know, and all that did for us was twofold. Um, a, it was sold to our engineering team. So Yogi, yes, it wasn't sold to IT, it was sold to engineers. And they loved it. You know, it got them visibility, they had great visuals and yada, yada, yada. But to me, in my purest form, I just swapped out Excel for Spotfire. And so for me, it looked like you've got this fantastic tool we started to build a corporate environment that's got blessed data, 
except that we've got this kind of this beast on the side, Hulk. You know, he's Hulk, he's strong, he's powerful, he can do lots, a bit wildly, you know. I've seen, you've seen the movies, he kind of runs all over the <laughs> place, he breaks everything. But our engineers had a lot of value in it. And, and what they also did is they also treated Excel, and they treated Access in those places that weren't well governed, like sources of data that they managed. And so, you know, all the stuff that you're talking about around, okay, what's my subsurface properties? And, and that was all of that kind of was kind of governed by our asset teams and they would just copy and paste Excel files all over the place and they would use it in reports and they would stand it up. Um, so I, it was real, it was, it provided a lot of value. Um, they were quick to go and made a lot of decisions off it. So, so Spotfire on its own is a highly valuable tool for organization and it's very ungoverned. And so I think as, a, as an organization you have to figure out how do you move quickly and how do you how do you enable your staff to do tools without trying to hold them back to say, it doesn't quite fit this model that we've been developing for five years, so I need you to stop doing that. And they would go tell me to pound sand. So um, our job was not to get in the way, and we just said at the time, like we said with access back here, you know what, we're just gonna choose not to worry about it because it's giving value, and they'll figure it out. And so we let them run and we let them sprint. Um, Where's your our forecasting data comes from Mosaic. Um, so, a bit of an interesting story with GLJ, who's our evaluator. Um, they were giving us PDFs after they were done their evaluation. So we had forecasting models that were stood up from Mosaic that gave us visibility that our engineers would do for budgeting. We built, I managed a software development team kind of beyond during the same time. So we built a, a long range planning tool that would look at scheduling and capacity. And so we kind of hooked those two things together. And then when GLG was doing our evaluations, we had very, very little visibility to when, until the PDFs got snapshot, they got sent off, and then our engineers were scrambling to kind of cut and paste, you know, data tables from PDFs. So we said, hey, let's do us a favor. You guys have to do your forecasting, your reserves within Mosaic. So then we built a model on top of Mosaic, so, and every hour, so our, our data warehousing would refresh the entire warehouse for our entire organization every hour. And so technically it was, it was a big effort to do that, but what they got to see was they got to see the reserves process being built and got to ask questions along the way. Um, and fancy reporting tools that just hit the refresh button and would call it a day. So Spotfire came in, um, it was great. And then our ecosystem, our data ecosystem started to grow. Um, and so what is a data ecosystem? So, um, there's a really good article actually on open data ecosystems. Um, it talks about the actors in your environment and, and the roles that they play within it and what they should be doing and what they shouldn't be doing. And I won't read it particularly, but it says it's just a bunch of things that interact with each other with high interdependencies. Um, you know, McKinsey had another one that said a data ecosystem is a platform that combines data and numbers to provide and builds value through usage of process data. And then Harvard Business School has a different one slightly. It says a data ecosystem as the programming language packages, algorithms, cloud computing services, blah, 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 blah. Um, it's comprised of the following five elements. And so a lot of this is related to, and if we boil it down a little bit from our lens, it's you've got data sources, where are you getting the data from? You've got data management, what are you gonna do with it? How are you, where are you gonna put it? And then the analytics side is how are we going to use it? Um, and within that environment, You've got all these actors and all these people that have a part to play in this environment. And as an example, like the consumers, the consumers Excel, the consumers Spotfire, the consumers your user, the consumers your AI team, your consumers your data scientists, um, your analysts from any part of the organization. Um, our engineers and our architects kind of build the system and, and they architect it and they make sure it works and they can stand it up. Um, and the providers is everybody your source systems, Excel, your third party vendors and so forth. So Yogi had talked about a little around interconnectivity and your vendors, that relationship is kind of hard. Um, it's true. Um, it's getting actually harder today because um, everything used to be on prem and it used to be really easy to touch. Um, so this environment, we're trying to foster, we're trying to grow within ARC resources. So in 2018, we had a fairly legacy, what I'm calling legacy today, um, data ecosystem. So we had data sources. They were largely on-prem. Oracle SQL, you know, we played with Excel, pick your package, master data services, you name it. 
Um, we had some APIs that were starting to show up in the, in the industry. Um, on the data management side, we had an ETL layer, we had structured content, and then we had databases. So where we were managing that data was fairly, I'd say, simple. And then analytics was reporting KPIs, Excel, Spotfire, Access, you name it. So that list is fairly, fairly small, the people and the consumers from this side and what tools they were using and how are they gonna use it. This list is pretty simple. And when I look at, and this graphic right here kind of describes you know, the legacy IT environment, everything in blue here is everything that your organization manages from the hardware to security, to the applications that sit on it, to the OSs, that's very traditional, still exists today. Um, I'm sure everybody has some sort of form of traditional IT in their environment. Um, and then you've got how these services were changing and they were increasing over time. If you fast forward, and what does modernization look like? Well, what you're trying to do is move your traditional IT environment into PaaS and SaaS services. So how do we manage less? Today it's a commodity. Um, you can purchase it, it's pretty easy. Um, sometimes it's cheap, sometimes it's not. We can have that debate. But I think, as Yogi said, different, different meeting, I think, or different, different. And then your ecosystem rapidly changes with how the market's changing with respect to data. So it's no longer just open on-prem and APIs. You've got cloud sources, you've got streaming, you've got edge, you talked about IoT. I don't know what's next. So who the heck knows what's going to be next? But this cloud environment is getting very big and very complex for the sources of data that we can tap and touch. From the data management side, you've got ETL, which still exists, you've got cloud services, you've got unstructured, you've got IT ops, which you have to look at, you've got structured, you've got data lakes, you've got big data, you, you name it, this environment on the cloud side is getting quite big and quite, quite complex. And then your consumers is now rapidly changing as well. So you talked about AI and machine learning, you've got prototyping, you've got ML ops, um, Spotify and Excel are still have a, part, a big part to play in that environment, you have application development. So, as the landscape's changing, and in 2018, it probably started to get a little bit real um, in industry and, and with our environment, that you could probably start tapping into this changing modernization transformation market that you had to start addressing, and, and we chose to address it in 2019. Um, and shockingly enough, this is actually the easy stuff. Um, the tech side is the easy part. Um, don't get me wrong, we, there's still complexity there. Um, but it's, it's not where you have to push and it's not where you have to spend time. Um, so in 2019, we decided to modernize. Um, you know, we're gonna go cloud. It felt like a bit of a storm um, as we were building it. Um, I think that, that transition, I don't believe is easy. Um, even though I said that's the easy stuff, I still don't think it's easy. Um, but we had to understand the impact of change. So ARC has been an organization since 1996 and so you guys had talked earlier about, you know, it's easy to do it when you're brand new. It's hard to do it when you're old. Well, you know, we're, we're, we're getting pretty old here. We've got a lot of data. We've got a lot of people that are used to doing stuff the same way. And we have a massive environment where we've got, where we've got business processes that everyone depends on that are hooked to this. So understanding the impact of changing that old picture is very difficult. And so existing tools mature and integrated into many business processes. Like if I just pick on a team, accounting, production, you name it, how many reports sit on an individual's desk that we all don't know about that is hooked to one or many pieces of our ecosystem um, that we're trying to like punt out the door? Um, so the impact of that change is massive. Um, we're going to disrupt every existing analytic tool that exists at ARC. That's the impact of the change. It's, it's not small. Um, Spotfire, I don't know if Hulk's grown in size here, um, Spotfire was getting much more powerful. So if you look at our asset teams, and people have asked me, well, why can't you use Power BI? Um, I used to be like, I don't know why they can't use, use Power BI. Well, it's not the same, like an, an engineering, tool like Spotfire is not the same as a dashboarding tool like Power BI. They're, they have a part to play, they have different parts to play within the ecosystem that you're building, um, but they're different. So this was getting bigger. When I talked about this like Shadow IT, I'm not sure if I would coin it as that, but it was a very strong analyst tool that they had power in their hands and they were doing what they needed to do. 
Um, and we were going to start migrating data from on-prem to the cloud. So we had to build a bridge. So we started this journey in 2019 to figure it out. And when we started the journey, we started with myself and one other individual. So they said to me, Mike, drop 90% of your existing team, give it away, and start this with two people and see what, see what this looks like. Because there's a lot to consider when you're making this modernization move. Or now that we know, we've, so hindsight's 2020. Um, so what did we do as an organization? And again, this is kind of pre-merger pre with 7G. Um, that's a different story. Um, so what did we do? We had to invest in people. So everybody that you have, maybe not everybody, but you've got a very traditional environment, inclusive of your architecture, inclusive of your technology, and your people that support it are also there as well. So investing in people was a, was a very big um, opportunity that we thought we had to do. Um, and so we invested in partnerships with Microsoft. We, we looked at companies like Databricks. We looked for third-party vendors in industry that we thought were ahead of us. And, and in 2019, as these things were becoming a commodity, um, the people that were ahead of us were like six months, three months, six months. Um, so we had to invest in training partners. And the other thing that we were trying to do was who should we target? What group were we going to target in the organization that did this? Well, in 2010, we started building our back office. And Hulk was getting bigger. So we thought the opportunity there was improving you know, making Hulk a little bit more stable. So we focused our energy and attention on our asset teams, who we thought were data rich, but digitally immature. And so we said, you know, we're going to target those groups to see what we're going to do. And so what we did is we went to the, those groups and said, okay, we need to find your people. Give us your best. And they're like, you know what, we got this geophysicist. We think he'd be good. I was like, okay, great. How good is he? He's really good. So if he makes recommendations on behalf of your geo team, how many people will trust him? Because uh, don't, don't give me somebody who's going to make recommendations on your behalf that your team doesn't trust. Yeah. So, so trying to find advocates in the business that we could pull off their day-to-day -day desk. And I, I was saying no. His day-to-day -day job has now moved from what he was doing, from being a geophysicist, to being a geoanalytics engineer. Like, we've got to get him off that desk and we've got to commit his time. Because in addition to investing in my people that I managed, around how to do this effectively, we had to make sure that the people that we brought along with the journey had to think about problem solving differently. So you got the same problem, but you got a new tool, and I have no idea how to use it. We also had no idea how to use it. So um, we all had to learn rapidly together. So we paired technologists with SMEs from the business. right? And the journey between when we realized that we went from a team of two kind of where we're at today, 20 plus. It took a couple of years to figure out that we needed more of those people's times than I think the business realized that they had to give. Um, so we had to do small projects where we had quick wins that showed huge value for the cost that we were getting by 20% or 30% off an engineer's desk. Um, and we started with our completions team, if you guys were wondering. Um, and we evaluated third parties. So we all went back to school. And then we had to invest in our modernization platform. Um, and in the traditional side, my team, which consists of data engineers and developers and traditionally the guys that are building stuff from scratch, we never managed the stuff that was in blue here. We never had to worry about it, right? And even though we targeted PaaS and, and SaaS services, um, even though these things aren't in blue, there's a lot that's blue that's not on this list. <laughs> And so, you know, when you talk about your cloud infrastructure, that was now owned and managed by my team. So even though we were targeting past services, every service that we were trying to play with, we had to own, manage, lift, configure, put security around it, automate it. So our DevOps skill sets had to increase dramatically. And I mean, and on the IT side of DevOps, right? How do you manage? Because that's, that's, that was it. It was still a past service, but it was still infrastructure that we had to manage. So trying to get your group to configure it. We had a, we had a strong DevOps practice on-prem, on you know, one-click deployments and, and so forth. Um, and we had a very strong relationship with our IT group, and we still do to this day. And so based on the way that we had set up our, our organization previously, gave us the kind of the credibility with them to say, oh, yeah, we trust you, you own it. 
here's the security policy that you have to manage and just make sure it looks like this and so forth and everything's all good. It's not always like that, so I've heard. Um, but that's a very tough thing to overcome if you don't have that, is your IT group needs to become your best friend if you're gonna own this stuff. Um, and then we had to figure out how we were gonna store it. What types, you know, I talked about all these different types of environments that we weren't seismic, high resolution data from our drilling rigs, from our completion rigs, you know, uh, you name it. We had to bring it through the door, we had to figure it out. Except that the environments, I'll go back, the environments for cloud weren't as advertised. Like, they weren't super mature, they're moving at a rapid pace, they're changing. I can't tell you how many times in the last three years we swapped out a piece of tech that we thought was gonna work really well and it didn't. Um, so, I mean, did we trip? Did we make a mistake? I'm not sure if you'd, I would chalk it up to that. I'd say that what we thought was advertised wasn't as sold and they weren't quite as mature. So this market is very brand new. It's moving rapidly. And so we had a legacy system that was bulletproof, strong. We were trying to go to this modern environment with all these modern tools. We were telling, oh, we're gonna do this. We had to build a bridge. We're like, actually, hold up. Wait, okay, we're gonna do this a little bit smaller. We're gonna make it a little easier. Um, we had to build modern tools. We had to update or change existing business processes. Um, we had to test new connections between existing applications and modern platforms. They didn't work as advertised, right, Phil? Right. So, and where we decided to focus was on our asset teams. Um, they were they were again really rich as far as data, um, but they were very immature on the IT side. On the IT side. Mike, can I ask you a question? Yeah. So the question would be that maybe it's just I see on the timing of it, that, yeah. that fine line between building and buying, like and have those decisions. Um, on the modern side, when I, and so I think Yogi showed that slide around maturity of our organization. Like there's a lot of applications within our environments that are very immature, right? So if you're trying to say, okay, is there a SaaS or PaaS service available in 2018 for subsurface geo? Trail. Uh, and when they say, okay, we've got this new modern environment, but it's just a lift and shift to the cloud so you can scale a little bit better than you can by buying hardware. Um, inter I think this is, this is a tough one. Um, the data side of buying is very hard to do, I, I believe, because you have to integrate it with everything else. And so you have to make sure that all the systems that you're purchasing play nicely in the sandbox with every other system that you have. That's a very hard argument. And so I think that the, the question is, do you, do you, what data service can you buy that does it, does it for you without having to configure it? And they're gonna say, oh, it's a, it's a platform, you don't have to develop it, but you configure it. I'm just like, well, it's just a different word for dev, um, in my opinion. So that's just me, I'm not speaking for, on behalf of anybody else. Um, so we knew that we had to do the data side of this argument a lot better, which I thought we had to scale ourselves. Um, so when we, when we built our data ecosystem, and I'm, and I'm looking back in time now, um, the things we had to consider is where will the presentation tools be used? And so, you know, we've got Horizon, you've got VDI, it's on-prem, you've got work from home, you've got in the office, every pipe that you have to whatever data set you're, you're doing actually changes depending on where you're at. And, and so what we found is we had to spend a ton of effort to figure out where's the data moving we had to work with our network team to say, where is it going to? Do we have dedicated pipelines to, to Azure, which is where a cloud, we're an Azure environment. Um, if you're hybrid, what are your connection limitations? And so we found speed differences between working from home or working from the cloud. Are you working from a Horizon desktop or are you working from your actual desktop, the application? And so, you know, understanding every single door that you could walk through, you know, we got two doors here. You know, if you walk through the door, it's gonna be the same experience for every door. It was, a, it was a very hard thing to, to, to understand and manage. Um, how modern are your presentation tools? So the data market is moving at a rapid pace. Like I, I, and I kind of highlighted here, you know, Delta, Databricks, Data Lakes, you got Synapse, you name it. These, these tools are maturing at a rate that I've, and I've been in the industry for 20 plus years, at a rate that I've never seen before. And they're, and they're moving so fast and they're updating so many things that you're, you're tying yourself to, that they're breaking purposefully to improve it, um, that you have to understand how those things are working in conjunction with the tools that you have today. 
Because the hardest thing to do is to replace every tool that your organization understands, Excel and Spotfire, I'll pick on those two specifically. Um, and if you're trying to introduce new tools, and we've got an organization of 1,000 people, you know, our, our engineering departments and our asset teams are massive, you can't rip and replace a tool from them that fast. And so we had to make sure that whatever we were building on the modernization side had to coexist in this ecosystem with the tools that they understood. Um, and then how stable is your platform of choice? I kind of talked about that. Do your existing connection drivers work? Like, I, like these things are a pain in the ass. Um, I'll get into that in the next slide. But it was a large effort to make sure that they worked um, with the environment with the standing up. Um, so the, the, the hard lesson is front-end tools are moving very slowly. Back-end tools are moving very fast. And the infrastructure environment around networking is much more complex in a work-from-home scenario and all these things around VDI and where these environments sit and so forth, because we're still hybrid. I'm assuming most of you are still hybrid. The hybrid world is the hardest place to understand where this works and how it works and how you can do it effectively. Um, so our ecosystem at a glance, and, I, and I, I'm painting this with a pretty broad brush, um, is we've got data sources that are flowing through our, our cloud environment. They typically land in Databricks and Delta tables. Um, we can talk about that later. Um, and then our, our consumption tools are Excel, Power BI, Spotfire, you know, connected through cubes. Um, I'm not really talking about our AI team that we've stood up. There's a whole AI component that's attached to this with a whole ton of work that's attached to these, these same data sets. But the challenges that we had was optimizing and creating connectivity with, with performance. Um, and they can connect, but with performance is a whole different ball game. We had to spend a lot of time navigating that. Um, as an example, you know, Databricks is the environment that we landed on with Delta Tables. If you guys, we can talk about that till the sun comes up. I'm, I'm fine afterwards. Um, but making sure that with the environments that we're bringing to the door. So we were standing up and replicating all of our on-prem data up, line by line, every single system that we had to do. And what we wanted to do was wanted to migrate everyone from their existing tools. If you were talking to a database, talk directly to ours because there's also data there that's not present in your on-prem world. So we've got our source data systems, which are landed. We've got a data warehousing environment that sits right beside it in the same environment. We've got high-resolution SCADA data. We've got high-resolution drilling data. We've got subsurface properties that you can manage and you can comb to your heart's content, all available through Access, Excel, Spotfire, and whatever tool we thought. And so that was a door that we knew we had to build. That door was very complicated to understand. Um, and what Phil does, I'll give Katie on a plug here. Um, and so what we did with, with Spotfire as an example is their tools that connected to both modern cubes and these data environments, they said they worked, they kind of did, they were slow as shit, right? So you know, we spent a lot of time with Phil navigating the partner relationship with Spotfire, navigating the relationship with CData, which is kind of a connector provider, that they had to make sure that those things worked. And so we worked directly with their engineers. They tested within our environment. We gave them a door to walk through. And we said, make this thing. And, and they tuned those, those connectors for us to the point that we could actually make this work. And that's kind of where we are today. Are you using TDB or ADS? Are we? Are you using PIP codes TDB or ADS? We're using ADS. Um, and so at, at the same time, like if I pick on Spotfire for a second, what we're trying to make sure is that the data that they're talking to is rubbed and scrubbed by us. And so whatever they're bringing through their doors, we're trying to make sure that's stuck with our environment. And like as an example, so let's pick on um, Power BI data sets, Power BI premium data sets, you know, cubes, call it modern cubes. Um, a lot of the transactions, a lot of the inline calculations that you can do in those environments are much easier to do there than they are to engineer them and land them materialized in a data set. And so we wanted to make sure that we took advantage of all the power for the tools that they could do. So I think Yogi showed a rate, rate time plot, right? Well, you can convert that to a cube plot. It means you gotta calculate all those cube plots. Well, cubes do that like a joke. Like it's, it's super easy. But Spotfire had a hard time connecting to them. So the option was, okay, we can re-engineer all the data to land it to look like rate cube, or we can figure out a way to have Spotfire connect to the tool that already does it really, really well. Yeah. And so we push that and we push that and we push that because you know, when we think about the backpack that we had to carry, we want to make sure that the tools that are designed to do those things very, very well 
that just let them do that. And so for us, it was worth it to spend the time to make those work um, so that we didn't have to take care of this problem 12 months from now, as an example. Mark, can I just add a point to that? Yep. Because I think it's important for some of the other folks that are in the room. So Pete, to your question, uh, AES is playing the role of connecting into Databricks, but to Mike's point, it's the data as the data is, so it's flowing through with all those business rules. But uh, the neat part is, using the advanced data services of TDD, you're able to connect to the cubes that they had already uh, a huge investment in, I'd say, Mike. Yep. Yep. Um, so we were able to repurpose that and, and then bridge that. So the, like, what I think about ARC and great story that they have, it's like, it's bilingual, right? You can choose whatever visualization tool you want, but it's all being served up from the data access layer that's been established, which, which is fantastic. And we don't really, we're not trying to put a limiter on what you can touch. So can you touch the tables, the environment, the, the data warehousing tables that creates the cube? Sure, great, go for it. You can talk to those, you can query those to your heart's content. Um, but you can probably just go to the cube and you can get all that data for free, all the aggregations that come with that and let that do the work. And, or you can do it in Spotfire and do all that work yourself and all the ETL that you wanna do. I'm not touching it because I gave you a door to walk through that does it for you. Um, but if you choose to do it and you ask for our help, I'm just going to point you in the direction that I think you should go in. And so, um, so culturally, that's probably the hardest thing to do. Um, let's see what else. Um, so, you know, we've been building this for two years. We realized that the culture within our organization was quite low as far as literacy was concerned. Um, a couple of months ago, we stood up a reporting and enablement team specifically to help with um, fostering enablement to the organization to say, do you know what tools to use? Can you organize training? Um, do you understand what we have within our, our walls that we manage? That is, that is a monumental task. Um, um, and so if you build it, they will come, not without a lot of effort. Um, it's funny, like we've been, and again, we've been on this transformation journey for years and years and years. Um, we've put on training for every single environment and kind of project that we've stood up. And okay, you show up, you do the training, but if it's not relevant right now for a problem that you can see and understand, you're gonna walk away, you're gonna totally forget it. So, you know, so now you manage on top of that all the ways that we're changing the way you can touch and play with and, and talk to data. Um, this problem is big enough that we had to create a team that helps foster this within our organization. Um, at the same time, we have to improve data literacy, we have to improve our governance and cataloging of what's there. Like we're also moving really quickly. There's a lot that we're adding to this thing all the time. Um, so I think that our, our ability to market our team and what we have is also quite low in the maturity side. So we've got to increase the maturity of our ability to market what we have. Um, and then we've got to train users on leveraging existing tools with new data. Um, we, it's funny, I had a meeting last week with our completions team and we were kind of talking about, okay, there's the trends that we're seeing in, in your guys' performance. And, and one of our, our FRAC modelers, so like these guys are brilliant. Like, like they're, they're way smarter than I am. And we're sitting there and he, we're like, hey, and we look at usage. Who's using our tools within your, within your department? Well, you, well, these are the reports you're using. Well, this is good high usage. And here's your high users. And this FRAC modeler sitting next to me is a brilliant guy. He's like, yeah, I was, like, I was spending like four days trying to figure out these drill surveys to figure out where we're gonna have FRAC placements. And God, it was such a pain in the ass. I was like, well, you know that there's a tool that we developed that you can pull drill surveys even as they're being drilled at your fingertips. But you're the guy that's low on this. You're like, you've never used it. He's just like, oh my God, if I knew this two days ago, I could have saved myself weeks worth of work. So, so you know, just building it, I don't think is good enough. Like educating, educating is a, is a I think that's what we do poorly. Um, we're really good at building. We're really good at setting up infrastructure. We do a really terrible job of, of, of marketing this from the perspective of, you know, you talked about, where's Ashley, is he still here? He left, um, you're still here. Um, who do you sell to? Well, I have to sell to our business now. So, like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a guy that's building, I'm a salesman, I'm, a, I'm trying to find value and opportunities. So there's a, there's a lot here. And then we've got to start an upskilling program. So in, in 2023, we're gonna start a, a, a campaign around development and literacy um, within the tools, cataloging, um, wikis for products that we build and how to use them. And it's funny, even our even the products that we do build, we get our SMEs that we work with to build, I'd say, technical documentation. 
but gives use cases for every single team, for every single tool that we build as an example of this is how you'd use it and when. Um, that takes a lot of effort. That's nowhere near a keyboard, the traditional sense of a keyboard to build, but it's part of, the, part of the ecosystem that I think you have to design and think about is the marketability of this. So um, that's it. Wait. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you have some of your SaaS providers step in and help you out, like the P2s and the IHSs and the Peloton, like some of those companies, do you, do you get involved or do they get involved in some of the data, the, uh, data marketing? And um, traditionally, no. Um, some of the people that you described are dinosaurs. So, um, um, and it's funny, like we've been, we've been building data warehouses on top of their environments for years. Um, they've asked to see it and competitively, how much do we want to give away? Right? And now like some of that stuff's become a commodity. Like, like you know, there's, there's great organizations out there, you know, maybe Dakota Analytics is one of them that knows how to touch those systems easy. They can build those things for you really quickly. Um, some organizations, Peloton as an example, um, they're modernizing. And so when they came to us about their Snowflake environment and how they wanted to build an ETL layer on top of that, we said, this will work for us if you can do these things. And so we asked them to architect the, the modeling, like data architecture, not necessarily the architecture of the, of the infrastructure, the architecture of their data models fit for purpose so that we could do CDC on top of it um, so that we can move it into our environment to stand it up side by side and then build models on top of that, right. that fit within our business. So, um, so we, do, we do partner with third parties. Um, we had an article with Databricks, I'm not sure if you guys seen it. Um, we started in 2019, we built an environment that pulled, I'll say quote unquote, real-time data from our NOV rigs. Um, it ended up being, I don't know, 45 minutes behind because of um, with ML and the way that they were serving it up. And so we said, this doesn't work for us. We need better visibility, we need faster visibility. So we worked with them to build new pipelines directly into IoT hubs to deliver it to us on a real-time basis, then we stream it through and serve it up. And right now we're entering the same engagement with Payson. Um, and, and, you know, and when you have data visibility with one vendor, you know, the types of rigs that you choose and the vendors that you work with get smaller. And so we've got to build environments that now it becomes service agnostic and, 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 and we can bring in multiple different groups into that environment, drilling for the drilling story. Yep. Yeah. Fantastic presentation. Thanks. Vendor login. You don't hear that. Vendor login. You don't hear that expression much. Vendor login, did you say? Lock-in. A lock-in, yeah. yeah. I'm wondering, it looks like cloud-wise you went all in on Microsoft. Yeah. Google invented Anthos to push the whole, you right. know, you've got to have some security by having right. more than one cloud. How did you rationalize going with this so heavily into a single cloud? Um, I think it boils down to people. So the, the more people that you have, the more skills you need within your team to manage it. Like, and I don't, think that, I, I don't think that we believe in farming out 100% of management to a third party. And so to understand and, and be in bed with your, with your providers or providers as an example, you probably need a bit of um, literacy in what those are. And all you're doing is either increasing your team, which everyone's GA sensitive to, or you're just making them masters of nothing. So, um, you know, we, choose, we chose um, at the time um, to say we've got a great partnership, our environment is Microsoft, our tools are Microsoft, it'll be easier to uplift and, and build capacity that way from a people perspective. And, and largely like Databricks sits on AWS and SQL Server, you can push it to the cloud with AWS. Or, so largely there's a lot of companies out there that are also cloud agnostic. Um, so I'm not sure that that either hinders or helps us. Yeah. I'll add something to that if you don't mind. Yeah. So I love the presentation because we went through the exact same journey. Uh, so I'm Mark from Open Take. Yes, you were. <laughs> Please continue. Either stand or sit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Like me. You're in stereo now. Yeah. <laughs> Your question, so we, we looked at the same thing. So we, we talked to AWS, we talked to Microsoft, um, had a bit of a bake off. But the thing you have to realize is how freaking complicated it is to get into the cloud. And then if you if you have Azure, and then you have AWS, then you have Google in your environment, you it, it would be impossible. They all, have to, they all have to talk to each other, yeah. 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 But your acquisitions, people have three pilots. 
And, and when we purchased 7G, they had a different environment that we did. And so we had to make the call. Like, you know, and we made the call based on who we thought could support the environment that, that we were bringing to the door. So, um, and, that, and even that decision, you've got to deprecate, you've got to move stuff around, you've got to, you know, stuff a square peg into a round hole. Um, technically, they're not necessarily easy problems to solve. Um, I think we're still feeling, I'd say, the effects, like the hangover of, of that environment and trying to make sure it all, all stitches together, especially as these tools behind them are still moving. Um, um, well, then you have the whole network, the whole network connectivity of, of every cloud provider. Every cloud provider, where, yeah. Uh, we found that uh, from experienced companies like an Equinix, where they have connectivity in all these data centers, right. you're going to be able to spin up an AWS environment to talk to an Azure environment. And you just, that's going to continue to, to grow and evolve, right. which then you throw the security layer on top right. of that and say, well, we have to connect to this, but it has to be secure because right. these guys need to have access. Right. So you're in that world where it's, it's constantly changing right now so quickly that how do you keep on top of that, right? Right. And you need staff to do it, and, and, <laughs> and your staff needs to understand it, and you also need experts. That could, so if you need to lead on somebody to help support it, they also need to understand it. That's also a, like, I don't know if you guys, like in the last 18 months of my world, I've rebuilt my team, probably 90% of them in the last 18 months, um, just because we were building skills in 2018 and 2019 that people found very attractive. So I've lost people to Silicon Valley, to Australia, to big tech firms. Um, so we're in a bit of a rebuild mode with people. Um, it, it's a totally different problem, we can get into that later, but um, it's, it's a very complex market that we're in in this industry. And, I, and I'd say we're now competing with the talent that we have, not with oil and gas, because there's a lot of, a lot of companies globally that are willing to pay oil and gas rates. Yeah. And so you know, we're, we, we do not sit in the bubble, and I've seen it firsthand, um, and so you gotta pay to play, no matter what you do. I was uh, just going to talk about people and the demand for people that we're hearing in the patch right now. So you've already started to answer that question yep. that you're rotating your folks out. Yep. Uh, and then, of course, there's a lot of pressure on the uh, energy resources industry to get people out of it. Like, I mean, the environmental challenge that the Canadians seem to be putting on themselves. Um, the alleged environmental challenge. The, the alleged <laughs> environmental challenge. Thanks, Yogi. Different debate. <laughs> So, are you building the resilience around that? Like, I know you're building your team over. Is yeah. there a lack of those people? I would say that um, I think there's two two different lenses to look through. Is one is you want experience, and you want people that have that understand technology and understand how these things work, even if they're not familiar with the the actual tech that they're working in. And so, we've got. Couple, you know, three or four senior guys that are quite strong that we're holding on to as tight as we can um, because they understand the environment that we've built tr traditionally. Yeah. They understand tech, right? And they're also super passionate about learning net new. And then we've got a whole breed of new guys that are walking, then girls that are walking through the door um, that we're trying to skill. Um, I, I've, we've had the luxury at Arc. I've been there for 18 years. We had a lot of longevity in our people. And so we had the luxury of the IP remain, so if you brought in a new resource, you had like 10 people or 20 people that could help mentor staff. Um, that is, that's lost. And so we've, we've retooled a little bit on our side with the people side is that you know, the onboarding process that we have to do, we've had to completely revamp around acumen. I talked about being a business developer, like the acumen around that space, do you understand what, what you're building and for why? So there's a whole week dedicated just to that. There's a whole week dedicated to these new tools that they've never seen. It's funny, I had a couple um, um, summer students. They're like, I've never used a database before. I was like, oh my God, I'm so old. Um, like, <laughs> and so, you know, and they've never seen Databricks. They've never seen Delta Tables. They're not teaching that stuff in university. So even trying to get them skilled up on the environment that we've built to, to make them like, so you can actually even push them in a stroller um, takes weeks. So we've had to build training programs and partnerships with, with Databricks specifically to say, okay, we need a training program for new, for new grads that we can walk through. So like when a new person comes to the door, we literally don't expect them to, to do anything for a month. Just so we can get them ready so that we're not, they're not asking the dumb questions that take half an hour off somebody's desk that you could resolve if you just did it by yourself for a week in training. So, and, and, and the amount of assets that we've had to build as far as documentation around how things work has completely revamped because of the 
because of the rotating door that I think we're going to see not only from an employee perspective, but also from a, from a vendor perspective because vendors are getting poached left and right too. So even the people that you probably had stability for traditionally, um, and, 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 I, and I'll, I'll be on a bit of a soapbox, is that the people that you're paying for are probably not worth the rate, but there's nobody else to find. Well, here's a soapbox. Uh, I know somebody that teaches oil and gas uh, petroleum engineering at SATE. Yeah. And those students are actually receiving letters from the federal government to say there's no future in this space. Yeah. Take wow. something else. Right. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow, hey? Wow. And that's, and that's the, that's and that's the, the industry we now need to step up and, exactly. and step into this, right? right? And really put our shoulder into this. Right. Anyway. Yeah. But we've got a big partnership with... Uh, Amy, Amy's the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute. So yeah. we've got, we've got yeah. a rotating internship program with them. We've been heavily invested with U of C and U of L and and U of A. U of A, by the way, has the like the third best rated AI education institution globally. Um, so if you can get in bed with them, maybe come in behind me. Um, <laughs> um, I'd say go for it. But you, know, you, you got to get pretty creative about how to attract talent um, and then how to keep it. Yeah. yeah, it's Agreed. been interesting when I've looked at hiring into comp side interns yeah. for engineering interns. Yeah. Most of them don't even know what SQL is. Right. Oh. No, no <laughs> clue. Period. Period. Or what spot footer tableau or right. Power BI is. Right. Which is fascinating that they're coming out of schools right. with zero. Zero skill. Zero of that skill set that we thought was dominant, and the pendulum's going to swing. So, like, our whole team almost touches none of that. Like, we're in. We're in PyScala, Python, big data environments. And again, that's, that's a bit of a mental mind shift for the guys that have got longevity in the industry and tech. So they've had to retool. But the, the young guys, like, you're, you're green. Like, you got your blank slate. So that, that's the fun part is you get to build talent and um, see them progress and see them mature in their careers. OK, terrific. Yeah. Mike, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks, guys.